What's up guys, this is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bot on Tip Tuesday. I hope you're doing super well. On Tip Tuesday, I go live and talk through a question submitted by a listener or somebody who's joined the inner circle. So if you have a question that you'd like me to answer for you following this video, you can go to definingdadbot.com slash inner circle and submit your question. So today's question was... Uh, submitted by a listener in Oklahoma, and she asked, hey Alex, when should I eat what? And I was like, wow, that's a really broad question. How about we narrow that down a little bit? So when I, I asked her to clarify a little bit deeper, she said, I'm especially interested in what should I be eating before my workouts and after my workouts to get the best results? So I've got uh, a bit of insight into this obviously from a training perspective but the the question as most questions are is pretty nuanced the first thing i would say is that it really depends on two things one what phase of training are you in okay that really matters what phase of training are you in and we'll talk about that in a second and then two how well are you regulating your blood sugar so th those are the two two questions and they're actually kind of related so We'll talk about how they're related in a second. So phases of training, if you've not followed the show, then that means that you might not be familiar with phases of training. I would highly recommend you go check out, I wanna say it's episode 13, and it's called Unlocking Your Workouts Potential. So I, I talk through the phases of, of training for the average person and for the athlete and how those kind of stack on top of each other. And the idea of phases of training is that there are certain ways that you train in order to create certain adaptations. So there's a certain way you should, you should lift and do cardiovascular exercise to get better at burning fat as a fuel source, for instance. And that is called the endurance phase of training. And there's a way that you should lift in order to increase the density of your tendons and ligaments and to activate different muscle groups to get better at using those in your workouts and that's called stabilization training and then there's a way that you should lift and do cardio in order to maximize the growth of your muscle tissue and that's called hypertrophy and so there are different phases of training that result in different adaptations remember our exercise is more than just burning calories our exercise is creating different adaptations. What's up, James? Good to see a brother from Connecticut. Thanks for joining us. So we're talking through this question, what should I eat before and after my workouts to get the best results? And so uh, to this young woman in Oklahoma, I'd say, hey, one really depends on your phase of training, okay? So I, I did a show recently with Joel Yakowitz from DexaFit Seattle, and we talked through some of the misconceptions around fasted exercise. And so there are some people who would say, hey, I wake up in the morning and then I just go work out, I don't eat anything and everything's fine. And uh, we talked through kind of the research implications of, of that in particular. But yeah, that's actually fine. Uh, Pre-workout, if you don't have to eat pre-workout, if you're in the stabilization phase or the endurance phase of training, if you're trying to get better at burning fat as a fuel source or you're doing slower, lighter work with emphasis on muscle activation and whatnot, that's fantastic. You could probably get away with not eating anything and, and working out in a fasted state. Uh, you'll burn fat better as a fuel source, yada, 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 right? But in hypertrophy, strength, or even athletic power training, not eating before your workout is very, very bad juju. Why? Well, if you're, if you're fasted and your glycogen stores are relatively low, what that means for you is you don't have any short-term energy stores to pull from. So you'll go work out but your performance will be suboptimal. You won't be lifting as much weight as you could do. You might miss out on two to four reps per set that you could have done. And like, ah, oh, that doesn't sound like a big deal. That's a big deal. When you're in those more intense phases of training, the intensity drives the adaptation. The intensity drives the adaptation. So if I'm, I don't know, take an easy example. If I'm bench pressing 225 pounds for five reps, but I didn't eat this morning. So can't quite get 225 pounds for five reps. So I'm gonna do 185 for five reps. Is that a big deal? Yeah, it's a really big deal. Those 40 extra pounds will make it such that your muscles don't undergo the stress required 
to grow the muscle tissue you're trying to grow. In other words, in those phases of training, if you're lacking the fuel that you need prior to your workout, then it's probably, well, not only is it suboptimal, but in some cases it might have been better that you just didn't work out today altogether or that you did something else. And so that, that's important. I, I, think, I think a lot of people don't understand when you periodize nutrition, that means that you eat intelligently in order to get the best out of your training, whether it's to lose fat or gain muscle or jump on a taller box or whatever it is, you eat differently based on your phases of training. So like when I first start with a client and their goal is to lose 100 pounds or something like that, or uh, maybe you don't have 100 pounds to lose, but you're deconditioned and you're starting you know, your workout program, I don't really harp on what you eat before your workouts. As long as you're not pumping yourself full of sugar, you know, I've, I've had people come to my workout and they're like, oh yeah, I had like two bananas, so I'm good. Like you're already bad at regulating blood sugar. You're gonna crash 20 minutes into our session because you're gonna have a blood sugar spike, then you're gonna start working out, you're gonna have a blood sugar drop, then you're gonna throw up on my shoes and that's not any fun for anybody. So all, all that to say, your phase of training really matters. In the, the less intense, higher volume phases of training, those you can get away with not eating before your workouts or what you eat before your workouts as long as you're not pumping yourself full of sugar is uh is probably a negligible effect on your training uh, whereas in the more intense phases of training then what you eat before your workouts really does affect what it is that you're you're actually doing in your workout so a note on that eating before your workouts what, what should you be eating if you're in an intense phase of training Generally, we like to give ourselves some form of complex carbohydrates that are gonna break down slowly over uh, the session itself. Uh, I remember in track in high school, we thought it would help us run faster to eat like four tablespoons of honey before, <laughs> before we ran. I, we, we never tested this scientifically, you know, just we just were like juniors in high school eating honey and crackers prior to our our one mile run or whatever it was. And that's, that's one thing. There, there is, there's a thing or two here or there to suggest that maybe getting some simple carbs before a max effort of 10 minutes or less, yeah, maybe that would, that would improve your, your function a bit. But if you have a one hour workout, the last thing you wanna do is spike your blood sugar and then drop it really hard uh, in the middle of your workout. I've, I've had people say, oh man, I have such a hard time getting through my workout and then I'll, I'll take a look at their food journal and, and see what it is that they're eating before their workout and they're trying to carb load prior to a one hour workout. Like, you do understand that most carbohydrates will break down and cause an insulin response within 30 minutes, right? So unless you've got a 30 minute or less workout, it's not helping you, it's probably hurting you. It's probably giving you a really hard time with that. So uh, prior to your workout, complex carbohydrates usually best. My personal favorite's oatmeal, it's just easy. If, if I'm waking up first thing in the morning and I want to get some complex carbs in my system before a good hypertrophy or strength lift, I'll, uh, I will literally drink oatmeal. I'll just put a package of oatmeal in my shaker bottle with, uh, with like half a scoop of protein and I'll drink it on the way to the gym. Like real, real simple. Not saying it's the best. I'm saying that's efficient, practical, and does the job, okay? Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the most important thing when you're a fit parent trying to get your workout in is, is, is practical and, and good solutions that make the best of what you know scientifically, not necessarily the most optimal. Um, optimal is great, but I'm not training for the Olympics here, man. I'm just trying to get through life as a fit dad and <laughs> balance my business and my family and, you know, not rip anything important while I'm exercising. Uh, so anyway, all that to say, uh, your, your phase matters. If you're in the earlier phases of training, you probably don't need to worry too much about what you're eating before your workouts as long as you're not pumping yourself full of sugar. Um, second, if you're in the more intense phases of training, like muscle growth, that's hypertrophy, or strength, or power, then a complex carbohydrate prior to your workout will give you some good fuel for that, that one hour, or two hour, whatever it is that you're, you're doing. Fun fact, your, your workouts over 90 minutes aren't helping your muscle growth. Your growth hormone peaks at a 90 minute, 90 minute interval. So um, stop, <laughs> if you're trying to grow muscle, 90 minutes and, and stop it. Uh, let's see, Travis says, James and Travis both have questions before I get to the post-workout. So let's, 
Let's address that. James says, how about eating prior to an hour of Krav? So Krav Maga is, uh, I mean, it's pretty intense. I mean, there are varying levels of intensity. If you're doing like a sparring match, like a, a group of sparring matches and stuff for, for an hour, you know, you're just going to be fighting for an hour. I'd treat that just like a strength or power workout. Whereas if you're doing like a, an hour of conditioning, you know, you're working on bags or you're doing forms and uh, in the Shorn Roo system, we used to call those katas. I'm not sure what they call them in the Krav Maga world. Uh, but if you're doing some sort of conditioning, then it really does, again, it's, it's like a lower phase, lower intensity training. But if you're fighting, that's, treat that like athletic training, man. That's complex carbohydrates prior and um, stay hydrated. And I don't mean Gatorade, okay? Like your, your Gatorade is almost as much sugar as it is water. That's, a, that's an ignorant statement. But my, my point is, you don't need a whole bunch of sugar to get through that. Just stay hydrated. Um, great question. So Travis says, I've always heard to carb load the night before a big event. Is that helpful? Uh, it depends on the event, right? And, and the research isn't very clear about whether or not that's helpful. So if I'm running, let's say I'm, I'm doing an obstacle course race. Let's say I'm doing a Tough mutter. That's a very, very long obstacle course race. That's an endurance race, okay? And carb loading, the idea is that somehow if I consume a bunch of carbohydrates, I will store a good amount of carbohydrates. And therefore, when I hit my event, then I'll have all the carbs I need to go through the event. Well, I've got news for everybody. You can only store, depending on how big you are and how well you've trained this in your liver and muscles, you can only store between 1,500 and maybe 2,500 calories of carbohydrates, okay? It's not a lot. Um, and fun fact, if you're 10% body fat and 200 pounds, that means you have 20 pounds of fat on you. There's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. That means that really fit dudes have somewhere around 70,000 calories of fat available. So the idea of carb loading is kind of silly because it's like, oh, I'm going to store up a bunch of energy so I can go run my race or do my thing. And it's like, you know, if you just kept your blood sugar stable, you have enough energy in your system to run across the U.S. Like you wouldn't have to eat anything if you could just actually tap into your fat stores. So, uh, so to the, the question, Travis, it's, it's a comic common anecdotal thing from the time of, of when we were starting to understand what role carbohydrates played in sports nutrition. But the smarter we get about endurance events, especially, uh, the more we understand that it's about keeping the blood sugar stable, not necessarily storing a whole bunch of carbohydrates so that, you know, we can get through the race with maximal energy. And uh, there's a few supplements that are helpful with that. Some people have you know, uh, feeding regimens during their races and stuff. People who do, do like really intense triathlon training, they actually have a schedule around, you know, I, I have to eat at this mile and I eat only this much of this thing. And, and that's, that's really ninja. But uh, to, the, to the point, I always like to say, you eat how you trained for an event. That's how, that's how you eat. If you didn't carb load every night before all of your runs, or you didn't carb load for your obstacle course training, you didn't, you didn't carb load for your workouts and stuff, then don't carb load for your event, okay? You're asking your, your digestive system to do a lot of things for you, and you're asking your blood sugar regulation system to do a lot of things for you that you didn't ask it to do in training. As close as you can keep your event to how you did things in training, that's what you should do. Um, and if you want to experiment with carb loading, you should experiment with carb loading, loading while you train, not the night before an event. So uh, great question. I appreciate that. So uh, the young lady's question was from, from Oklahoma. She asked, what do I eat before my workouts to get the best results? I hope I've given you uh, a couple ideas around that. Um, you know, the last thing I didn't say about that was about digestion. When you work out, you're, you're you're stressing your body. It's a sympathetic nervous system response. And so what happens is your body moves all the blood in your bloodstream toward your extremities. That's a good thing. You want that to happen. It's, it's you know, how you fight mountain lions or run really fast, right? Um, but what that means is it moves the blood away from your digestive system. So you don't want to eat anything, you know, with an hour of your workout that's going to require a lot of digestive effort. So a complex carbohydrate is not bad. That breaks down in your mouth and then breaks down the rest of it in your stomach via stomach acid. It's no big deal. But eating like steak and eggs or an avocado and peanut butter or 
really high fat, high protein, complex foods that asks your body to handle a lot of digestion while you're working out. Um, and that's just not conducive to the whole digestive process. Moving blood away from your digestive system while it's trying to break down eggs, for instance, isn't going to help you with your workout, first of all. But second of all, it might leave you with a stomach ache. Uh, we, we learned this anecdotally again in track in the high school. You eat a big, I had my, my lunch period was moved to like 1.15 or something. And then we had track practice right after school. And I learned the very first week of, of my senior year of track practice, you can't eat a big lunch an hour before doing sprints. Or at least not with my coach, man. I only threw up twice and, well, you learned that real quick. <laughs> Plus school pizza is not very palatable to begin with, but that's, that's another story. Probably shouldn't be eating school pizza either. This is, this is actually about the time that tomatoes became considered a veggie. Anyway, that's a rabbit trail. It's tomato sauce, not tomatoes. Tomato sauce legislatively became a veggie. So sad day for Americans everywhere. Uh, the, all that to say, pre-workout really matters if you're in the higher intensity phases, not quite as important in the lower intensity phases. What about after workout? Uh, you know, I have a special spot in my heart for the post-workout nutrition question because I remember I remember when I'd been training about three years and I had a client who was, was working to lose about 45 pounds or so. And we lost about 12 pounds together and she kind of stalled. She, she stalled after about a month or so. She stalled in her workouts and she's like, I'm not understanding why I'm plateauing. And I'm like, well, keep a food journal for me, bring it in, we'll, we'll look at what's going on. And she had chocolate milk in her food journal. And I was like, what in the world? Chocolate milk? Like, when is that okay? I don't. She goes, oh, I heard on the news that chocolate milk is the best thing to drink post-workout. And I had, I had read the study, not just heard it in the news, but read the study. And it was on NFL Combine players. And the, the question the study was, if we compared all these different things you could have right after a workout, uh, what one helps you recover best? What's the best protein to carbohydrate ratio in a post-workout food? And it was, you know, for NFL Combine players, they saw less delayed onset muscle soreness, better performance the next day, better sleep quality, all those things, if they had chocolate milk after their workouts. Chocolate milk has about a four to one carb to protein ratio. And so this study went you know, to the news and stuff. This was before Facebook and social media was really huge. Uh, they went, went everywhere and it was like, chocolate milk, the best post-workout drink you can have or whatever. Um, and I'm like, hey, okay, look, if your goal is to compete in the NFL and you're training, you're, you're at the NFL combine and you're trying to reduce delayed onset muscle soreness and you're trying to run your 40 faster, fantastic. You want a four to one carb to protein ratio. What that does is it spikes your insulin so that your, uh, your cells are open and responsive to the amino acids in the protein. And so you recover faster. It actually does start a recovery process faster. And, and insulin, insulin growth factor one specifically, can be a really huge part of restoring tissue. So that's all good. But, but insulin is the most anabolic hormone in the body, or at least as far as we know currently, it's the most anabolic hormone in the body. What's anabolic mean? It means building tissues out of small molecules, right? It means, means building larger molecules out of small molecules. If you're trying to lose, 45 pounds and you are you're after a workout you're in a state of epoch excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption you're burning more calories than you were before your workout you know so you're you're burning fat post-workout it's all well and good but then you spike your insulin you cut off your fat burn and you tell your body to grow tissue rather than to burn tissue which is what you're trying to do if you're trying to lose fat then chocolate milk post-workout is a big no-no that's a, that's a bad idea. That's a <laughs> unless, unless you're just trying to grow some muscle during this weight loss process so that you have a higher metabolism for future phases or something, then great. But, but no, no, no chocolate milk for you, client who wants to lose 45 pounds. We don't do that post-workout. Don't shoot your fat burn in the foot when you're trying to burn fat post-workout. So 
fine for NFL combine players, fine for anybody who's working athletically to grow muscle or increase performance or reduce delayed on set muscle soreness or recover faster or whatever, but bad for you if your goal, primary goal in this phase is to lose fat. So all that to say, what should you eat post-workout? If you're in a performance phase and you're trying to restore tissue, okay, you're trying to recover better and you could care less whether or not you gain a pound or two of fat during this phase, then uh, post-workout four to one carb to protein ratio is pretty powerful. And yes, the, that, there's, there's been a few bodybuilders who like to say it this way, the dirtier the carbs, the better. I, I don't subscribe to that line of thinking, but the idea being that if they break down quickly, simple carbohydrates can be a more powerful insulin response and therefore more powerful recovery and greater capacity for muscle growth. So that's that. If your goal, on the other hand, is to lose fat, it's your primary goal and the primary goal of this phase and that particular session of training and you're trying to uh, make the most out of your fat loss while also recovering, then it's probably best to either limit your carbohydrate consumption post-workout or consume only complex carbohydrates post-workout and then a little bit of protein and a little bit of fat as well. The fat will help to mitigate the hunger response. So some people work out really hard and then an hour later, it's like they're starving. And when, you're, when you feel like you're starving, you, you don't eat chicken and avocados. You eat, well, everything but probably. <laughs> Most people do. When, you're, when you feel like you're starving, you, you, you don't stick with the program. You eat all kinds of stuff. Uh, but anyway, the, the little bit of fat will mitigate that hunger response. And then the protein will actually help the recovery process. Even though fat loss is the goal, you still need to recover. And so the the amino acids in your bloodstream will actually foster a better recovery. So I've said a lot of things here. Let me summarize for you. So to, to the woman who asked, when do I eat what? Uh, Pre-workout, if you're in the earlier phases of training, you're conditioning, you're trying to increase mitochondrial density, burn fat as a fuel source. I don't mind if you do a fasted workout or I don't mind if you have your protein shake or you have a little bit of oatmeal or something. It's really not gonna affect your workout performance a whole bunch. And as long as you're, you're not pumping yourself full of sugar or eating a very large meal, it's not going to make much of a difference one way or another. Um, in the higher intensity phases of training, some complex carbohydrates can be really helpful to maintain your level of performance during that workout. Um, and then for post-workout, if your goal is NFL combine, grow muscle, athletic performance, recover as fast as possible, then a four to one carb to protein ratio is great. Yep, chocolate milk will get it done, that's for sure. Uh, one of my favorites to recommend to clients though is an apple and uh, either uh, some, some source of easily digestible protein. So whey is a, is a good example. You, if you don't do well with dairy, you can do like goat whey. I'm a fan of cricket protein as you guys know, so that's an option. Um, anyway, so that, uh, that's a good way to do things with that four to one carb to protein ratio without, I don't know, eating dirty carbs. <laughs> and then um, the, the second piece of that is if your primary goal is fat loss, steer away from the four to one carb to protein ratio. You don't need to be modulating your insulin up right after your workout. Uh, you might recover quickly, but it's also gonna shoot the whole trying to lose fat from my post-workout metabolic spike in the foot. So don't do that to yourself. Thanks for the question. That was excellent. I appreciate you. Uh, thanks for listening to the show and submitting that. And to anybody who's listening who wants to uh, dive into this Tip Tuesday stuff, I formalized the process for submitting questions since I started this. A lot of people have reached out and whatnot. You can go to definingdadbod.com slash inner circle. And uh, there's an opportunity on there to, to fill out the form and submit your question. And uh, I'm happy to happy to tackle it on a Tuesday. So thank you guys so much for listening. I hope this was helpful and powerful for you. And this has been Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. Until next time, guys, kick butt, take names.